All right, um, so the, this latest four-part series that we're doing um, kind of um, flowed from a, another series that, we're, that we have ongoing with the college that many of you all have probably attended uh, that commemorates uh, key moments um, in the 75th anniversary of World War II. And in talking to uh, Chris Johnson and, and earlier Bud Metter, um, we kind of concluded that you can't deny the fact that a lot of what happened in the Middle East during and immediately after World War II um, influenced what is happening today. Um, but it also became clear that that wasn't something that we were going to be able to do with a single 60-minute presentation. So in the spirit of uh, Frasier and Happy Days and Joni Loves Chachi, uh, we decided to launch a spinoff. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, my only request when we, when we launched this spinoff was that I wanted it to be a largely um, unbiased look. I wanted somebody that would come in and would acknowledge what we did right and what we did wrong um, that, that uh, led to where we are today. And I think we've gotten that, um, you know, um, ultimately I think we've gotten that in large part uh, because of the man who has created and presented this series. Um, tonight is the penultimate presentation in this uh, four-part uh, spinoff. And uh, the man responsible is an assistant professor of military history and a teaching team leader at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. He's the author of eight books. Seven of those are focused on using historical analysis to inform current and future decisions. He served in the Middle East for more than eight years. During that time, he was an officer in the Jordanian Army, a liaison to the Israel Defense Forces, an advisor and analyst in Iraq, and was responsible for coordinating training between the U.S. and the United Arab Emirates. In short, this is a guy that knows what he's talking about, and we should probably listen to what he has to say. Please welcome back to the Kansas City Public Library one of our favorites, Brian Steeden. That's the first time I've ever been introduced as a comparison to Joni Loves Chachi, <laughs> which, as a fan of, uh, of Happy Days, I actually never watched that program, so I feel somewhat... Okay, anyway, uh, it is always a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank everyone for joining us here on this third uh, part to, again, discuss World War II in the Middle East. So I want to begin with where we will end it is the topic that most people connect with the Middle East, terrorism. On the morning of 22 July 1946, Jewish terrorists detonated explosives in the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, killing more than 90 and wounding an additional 40 plus. The King David Hotel was the headquarters of the British mandatory government, meaning the government of the mandate in Palestine. The political purpose of the attack was to drive the British out of Palestine. World War II has been referred to as the Good War, and it is certainly the Good War with respect to cinema. The movies love this war. The war presents some very stark character descriptions. There are good guys and bad guys. As far as Hollywood goes, there are no worse bad guys than, the, than Nazi Germany. Therefore, those who oppose the Nazis are the typically shown in stark contrast as the best good guys. That includes the British. But rarely in these movies, and especially in the ones set in the Middle East, does the audience get to hear the perspective of the local populace. What did the Berbers, the Arabs, the Jews, etc., think about the war and those waging it? In general, they were not fans of, their European, of the European powers. In general, they hoped that the war would not strengthen the power of their colonial overlords. By that, I mean Britain and France. In a world at war, if you are rooting against one side, you are probably for the other. The fact that the general sentiment of the Middle East was pro-German provides some of the fuel for why the Arab is not a sympathetic character in most American media depicting World War II. Tonight, I want to finish this three-part series on World War II, and as was said, the, I love the word, penultimate presentation on the Middle East by expressing, in part, why the locals were not fans of their colonial masters and the problems this caused. 
At the beginning, I asked the question, how did the U.S. go from having no security relationships with the Middle East in 1939 to having all of these security relationships by 2019? Essentially, we have become the protector of the region. There are four reasons. Great power competition, oil, Zionism, and terrorism. Tonight, I will address each of these areas in that order. I want to begin with a story. In this picture, he is not very young, but I want you to imagine young Abdullah as a four-year-old boy playing in the dirt streets of his village in the hills bordering the southern edge of the Jezreel Valley in British Mandatory Palestine. He is playing there as news comes to the people that World War II is over. It is almost certain that people wanted to know what would happen to the British Empire in their area. Let me go back to that. In a couple of years, young Abdullah was no longer living in a world with British soldiers marching through the streets or driving by his village. By the time he was seven, there was a great war that drove people from villages, destroyed their homes, and sent hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing from the region. This was the war that gave birth to the state of Israel. Abdullah's family didn't leave, but many in the neighboring villages did. Now the soldiers that walked through Abdullah's villages, village were Jordanian, and they spoke Arabic. Israeli soldiers were only a few kilometers away, manning towers overlooking wire-marked wire -marked border. Abdullah was very smart. He studied hard. He was one of the best students in his village, maybe the best. He became an elementary school teacher. After more than a decade as a teacher, he left Palestine for Syria, where he earned his master's degree in studying Islamic law. Shortly after earning the degree, his village was again changed. This time, the soldiers walking through his village were Jews, and they spoke Hebrew. This time, his family fled to neighboring Jordan. Abdullah initially joined the groups opposed to the Israeli occupation of his village and the surrounding areas. He didn't last long with the groups that made up the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO, as he found them to be too secular, too communist, and not enough Muslim. He continued his education at the prestigious Al-Azhar University in Cairo, where he earned a PhD in Islamic jurisprudence. Abdullah continued his association with education as a lecturer at King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia where he befriended an Egyptian named Muhammad Qutb. We're going to talk about his brother, Syed, at the end of today's presentation. During Abdullah's tenure in Saudi Arabia, the Soviet Union entered Afghanistan in 1979. Abdullah wrote a galvanizing treatise on the appropriate Muslim response to this action in one of the most influential semi-legal redefinitions of the word jihad he argued that it was incumbent on all Muslims to fight against the foreign invader and expel them from Afghanistan. This young boy, who we first met on the streets of British Mandatory Palestine, had become one of the most influential recruiters of fighters against the Soviets. He inspired tens of thousands of young men to gather, train, and fight. He also inspired the donations of millions of dollars in support of such fighters. One of Abdullah's students in Saudi Arabia, and also a man deeply inspired by Abdullah's legal arguments, was a young Saudi named Osama bin Laden. Together with an Egyptian doctor, these three men formed what we call Al-Qaeda. So what were the scars left by the war? Abdullah Azam's life story that I just recounted expresses some of those scars. One, we were. The United States had no experience or understanding of the Middle East, other than a, a few missionaries and some oil workers. Now we had hundreds of thousands of soldiers marching and driving across the region. They didn't know the languages, the cultures, or the people. This ignorance created problems. Two, the world economy was changing. The transformation of power generation from coal to oil represents one of the great shifts in human economic history. It also elevated the importance of the source of the new fuel. The Middle East was no longer quaint. It was economically essential, especially if we were to rebuild war-torn Europe. 
Three, the United Kingdom exhausted itself in fighting World War II. It had nothing left. The empire on which the sun never set was dying. This left a power vacuum in the region. Four, for native Middle Easterners, World War II was not the good against the bad. It was the occupiers against their enemies. Most locals hoped that Germans would win because they believed that this would force the British to leave. Contrary to the images presented in the documentary film Raiders of the Lost Ark, there was no massive Nazi dig outside of the city of Cairo. And therefore, all of the locals did not get a chance to appreciate that the Nazis would have been worse taskmasters than the British. All the locals knew was that the British were here and they were snooty, oppressive, and disrespectful. The locals wanted them gone at any cost. And this is not reflected in any film, not even Raiders. Five, the domestic population of the great powers that won the war, primarily the British, had suffered much in sacrificing to win the war. In making these sacrifices, they were promised a better future. They wanted that future. They did not want to sacrifice even more for control of a distant and foreign empire. And six, the end of World War II gave the Middle East the state of Israel. Regardless of whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, the manner in which the state was created generated lasting scars. So far in these presentations, we have been talking solely about great power struggles, but today we are beginning the Cold War in the Middle East. The Cold War here was simply an extension of a struggle that had been going on for more than 200 years in South and Central Asia, the Great Game. That game was played between the British and Russian empires. Imagine that game as a two-person card game. Sometime, and this differed depending on where you were in the region, but sometime between 1945 and 1956, the United States came to the table, tapped the British lion on the shoulder, and assumed its position, and in the process, assumed all of its IOUs in the pot. Now, I just have to mention, I hate cats, and I find this picture hysterical, okay? <laughs> so, this plays out most starkly in Iran, which was the cat being abused in the previous picture. If you remember from the previous two presentations, Iran played a critical role as an avenue for feeding resources into the Soviet Union in the form of Lend-Lease. The Persian Corridor, as it was called, was crucial to the Soviet war effort. The numbers of equipment that moved through the corridor was impressive. I want to remind you that if you were asked the question, what vehicle won World War II, the answer you should give is the two and a half ton truck. That was the vehicle that separated the Allies from the Axis. And you can see here the vast quantities of that truck shipped through the Persian Corridor. It required the Soviet Union and Great Britain to invade Iran to set up this corridor. They invaded, deposed the sitting monarch, and installed his apparently weak-willed and supposedly malleable son on the throne. That man, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, became the Shah of Iran, who was run from his country in 1952 and in 1979. To bring him back in 1953 required the support of MI6 and the CIA. Yes, that is right. James Bond and Jason Bourne worked together <laughs> to collapse the government of Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh and reinstall the Shah. The argument used by the British government to support the coup was that Mossadegh's nationalization of the oil industry could destabilize the Iranian economy and make it susceptible for Soviet and communist influence. And in 1952, as you probably all know, anti-communism was a powerful motivator. If you remember the scars previously referenced, this brings together the dying British Empire, the importance of oil in the global economy, the dislike of the locals for colonial powers, and the ignorance of the United States, all in a single international incident. On the positive side, it worked. And the CIA was successful. It was actually the first time they toppled a foreign government. What do you know? On the negative, the collapse of the Mossadegh government and the suspected US involvement poisoned Iranian-US relations 
to the present. The issue with Iran was couched as a Cold War struggle, but it began as a struggle over oil revenues. The British Empire was dying and it needed revenues to maintain some level of prestige. Oil was becoming the necessary global commodity. I would like to remind those who have been to earlier presentations and introduce the new members of the audience to the timeline of oil discoveries in the Middle East. Okay, so please note that I include North Africa in that geographic phrase. The countries are highlighted to discriminate between whether oil was discovered before World War II in green or after World War II in brown. Even though oil was discovered in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia before World War II, the discovery of the world's largest single oil field, the Gawar field, did not happen until after the end of the war. It is this field and others that allow Saudi Arabia, absent drone attacks, to be the only country in the world with the ability to simply provide more oil to the global market. Most other countries produce very close to capacity. The U.S. was, before the war, and is today, the global leader in petroleum production. That's the good news. The bad news is we are also the global leader in petroleum consumption. Uh, the importance of oil following World War II was not for the United States. It was for Europe. We made enough for us. Europe moved from coal-based to oil-based oil electricity production in the post-war years, and it need petro needed petroleum to rebuild after the devastation of the war. Further, the promises made by wartime political leaders in Britain and France meant that life after the war needed to be better and be worth the sacrifices made during the war. People wanted things, cars, household appliances, and to par paraphrase the graduate, plastic. <laughs> so following the Yalta Conference with the big three, President Roosevelt sailed south to the Suez Canal where he met with King Abdulaziz bin Saud on the USS Quincy in the Great Bitter Lake, which sits in the middle of the Suez Canal. During the conference, the two aging and ailing men shared stories of health problems, which led to President Roosevelt giving his spare wheelchair to the king. <laughs> they also agreed to a quid pro quo of sorts, where Abdulaziz agreed to provide affordable oil, and Roosevelt agreed to protect Saudi Arabia from outside threats. In 1945, these threats were primarily British. Effectively though, effectively, though not formally or legally, this made Saudi Arabia the first US protectorate in the Middle East. More followed. So for those in the audience who may be thinking, what has Saudi Arabia ever done for the US? The answer is, give us a non-communist Western Europe. Without cheap Saudi oil, the Marshall Plan fails. Roosevelt further agreed that he would consult the king on any decision regarding the fate of Palestine and the possibility of a Jewish state there prior to making that decision. Now the president died less than two months after this meeting and it is unclear whether his promise was ever shared with Harry Truman, which leads us to our subject of Israel. Jews were immigrating to Israel for centuries, but the world Zionist movement was less than a half century old when World War II be began. The global Zionist cause encouraged immigration to Palestine, and the Jewish agency helped those who arrived to settle. The rise of the National Socialist Party in Germany, the Nazis, sparked increased departures to Palestine. These new arrivals, along with the tens of thousands that preceded them, angered the local Arab population, which led to a revolt from 1936 to 1939, and it took the British, along with the soldiers from the Arab Legion of Jordan, three years to calm it down. Part of what calmed the rioters was the issuance of a British white paper in 1939, and that called for the limiting and ultimate end of Jewish immigration in Palestine. Faced with the choice of the white paper or Hitler, the Jewish agency split the middle. David Ben-Gurion, then the head of the agency, stated, quote, 
We will fight the white paper as if there is no war, and we will fight the war as if there is no white paper, close quote. He knew that a war was coming, not the one in Europe, to which he referred in his statement, but the one for the future Jewish state. He believed that illegal immigration needed to continue to save those Jews who could be saved from Germany. He also believed that the Jews in Palestine needed to learn how to fight a large-scale conflict in preparation for the fight to come, and the best way to learn this was in the British Army. The creation of the Jewish Brigade was a long time coming. The Jewish Agency began asking for its creation from the beginning of the war in September 1939. It took five years. Now, it's important to remember that the British Army had national contingents from all parts of its empire operating within its army. So the argument that they should have a Jewish unit was not necessarily that out of line. Ben-Gurion and other Jewish agency leaders encouraged local Jews to join any British Army organization that they could. The first were Pioneer Corps companies formed to operate in the local area. Mostly they operated, and particularly they were most important uh, at the time in which everybody thought Rommel was going to make it to the Suez Canal. And the pioneer companies were establishing defenses uh, in and around Cairo and also in and around the canal area. Later, the British formed a Palestine regiment that was to be 50% Jewish and 50% Arab. The Jewish agency paid local Arabs to enlist to increase the number of Jews allowed in because it was a one-for-one -one deal. So a Jew couldn't sign up, essentially, unless he had an Arab with him. So the Jewish agency would pay for the Arab to go down there so a Jew could go with him and sign up. The Arab population was not supportive of the British and as they blamed the empire for the current situation in Palestine. The Jews were not fans of the empire, but they recognized the utilitarian benefits of both fighting the Nazis and learning critical skills. As the news of the Holocaust became better publicized, the pressure on Churchill grew such that eventually he had no option and he formed the Jewish Brigade. This was actually a brigade in the British Army. It wore a patch with the Star of David. This was the first officially recognized Jewish military unit since the days of the Roman Empire. Its membership produced numerous future general officers, Israeli general officers. And as you note up on here, the president of Carnival Cruise Lines. So, uh, well, he's passed away, but he was the founding president. Okay, so the unit was formed, trained, and equipped in the fall and winter of 1944-1945 and it deployed into combat in time to fight in Italy in the spring of 1945. The unit fought well, but only briefly during the, before the war ended. The difference it made was in the work it did after the fighting ended. Many of the brigade had family in Eastern Europe, and they sought them out. The brigade used official assets to shelter, move, and emigrate Jews from Europe to Palestine. The, this effort con continued throughout the brigade's existence and included the falsifying of army records such that the soldiers redeployed were actually Jewish refugees masquerading as members of the brigade. The illegal emigration activities became known such that the British were, uh, were forced to move the brigade first from Italy to Belgium and then they disbanded the brigade. Thousands and possibly tens of thousands of Holocaust survivors received assistance from the brigade before it was deactivated. The Holocaust Memorial in, Yad Vash is in Israel is called Yad Vashem. It is built with a central cement corridor and is kind of shaped like a boat, boat's hull. So you enter and it dips down, slopes down, and then it slopes back up. And there are chambers on the right and the left, and you weave back and forth into each of these display chambers, which is where you actually, that's where the museum really is. And you can't actually walk down the central corridor, even though it's open, because they have uh, areas where there are displays in the middle, or there's parts where the walkway itself is taken away. But you can see from the front to the back. 
The second to last chamber on the right explains the liberation of the death camps. Now this is typically where most Holocaust stories end. To me, the most important chamber was the last chamber on the left, which is the one immediately following the uh, liberation of the death camps. This explains what happened when Jews went back home. Many did not have homes to return to, either in the form of building or village. Many others were not welcomed back as their homes and property had been claimed by others during the war. Some were violently attacked and killed. It is this chamber that really gives the answer for why people believed there needed to be a state of Israel. Because where was home for a Jew in 1945 or 1946? The answer, according to David Ben-Gurion and many others, was their own Jewish state. We could spend the entire evening on the various partition plans and how this process worked. The key event is that in 1947, the United Nations voted for the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. Nobody liked the plan. The Arabs didn't like it, and the Jews didn't like it. But the Jews supported it, knowing that the Arabs would not, because they wanted to get a moral or legal high ground in the debates that they expected that would follow. Now, as you can see, every neighbor of the proposed states and all Muslim UN member states opposed the partition at the time. Most Arabs will tell you that they think the Holocaust was horrible, but they don't understand why the Arabs had to pay the price for German behavior. Opposition to the newly declared Jewish state was not enough, as in opposition in the UN. The notion that the state of Israel was forced onto the Middle East by European powers, just as had the same European powers forced crusader states upon the region nearly a millennium earlier, burned into everybody's consciousness. Now, I use that language of crusader state because it is a common term if you read most Arabic language editorials, and it is the common term for the state of Israel if you read Islamist extremist material at all. So remember the promise made by President Roosevelt to King Abdulaziz of Saudi Arabia. President Truman did not consult the King of Saudi Arabia, and the region felt betrayed by the United States as they had previously seen America as an anti-colonial protector of small states. Then Secretary of State George C. Marshall vehemently opposed the idea of supporting partition and later the Declaration of Independence by Israel as he felt it would poison U.S. relations with the Arab world. He accused Truman of being politically motivated in a tight election season. Now it is unclear in my opinion how much support or how much the support for Israel helped Truman in the election. But one of the points I think that is often missed in this discussion of why Truman did this is the appeal to Truman on biblical grounds. The restoration of the state of Israel is often referred to as being prophesied in scripture. Truman, contrary to his swearing, was a religious guy. And he was certainly impressed if not swayed by the appeal to scriptural fulfillment. I mean, who doesn't want to be the guy mentioned in the Bible? So the war for Israel's independence was costly on both sides. The armies of the surrounding Arab states were neither well-trained, nor did they have well-maintained equipment. The, pro the poor performance of the militaries against what was perceived to be a weak Jewish people was one of the causes of the downfall of the Egyptian monarchy, and was used as fuel in opposition to governments in Iraq and Syria. Now, neither side was well prepared, and certainly not as well prepared as they needed to be. So I want to share a brief story on the battles for Latrun. So Latrun is this, uh, in the lower left-hand corner, this is a picture of it. Today, it is the uh, Israeli Armor Museum, and it is also their memorial for all the armor soldiers who have fallen. 
this was a key British police station that sat at the junction of roads leading to Jerusalem, marked in blue, and Ramallah, marked in red. Arabs defended the police station, and the Jews attacked it on three occasions. The third attack included Jewish refugees who had recently arrived at the port in Jaffa from Europe. They were handed guns, loaded up onto trucks, and dismounted a few hundred meters short of the police station, and then sent into the attack. I think you can imagine what happened. They did not do well, and experiencing significant casualties uh, in their effort. What makes this fighting interesting is the inaccurate mirror imaging that occurred. The Jews wanted the police station so that they could move safely along the road to Jerusalem. The Arabs wanted the police station to protect the road to Ramallah. The Jews did not want to go to Ramallah. And the Arabs at the police station did not care about the road to Jerusalem. Each side fought hard to secure something that the other side did not care about. The solution came when the Jews made a new road slightly to the south that bypassed the police station. To me, this set of engagements speaks as a microcosm of the problems in the region. Neither side really understands the other, and though they could probably get along together, instead they struggle against each other to defend something the other side does not care about. We end where we began, on the subject of terrorism. In the modern period, politically motivated violence by non-state actors has been used for different purposes and with different motivations. David Rappaport has identified four waves of terrorism. We have interacted with waves two, three, and four in this three-part series. The Jews and Arabs who fought for or opposed the British, the Arabs, or the Jews initially fought for nationalist reasons. The groups brought under the umbrella of the PLO typically had secular, socialist, and or nationalist ideologies. And we have already seen with Abdullah Azam, and we will see again with our last person, Syed Qutub, the critical influence of religion. The changing of terrorist thinking in the Middle East is a complicated yet comprehensible process of ideological transformation over hundreds, dozens, and individual years. World War II played a role in shaping the environment that created the terrorist world that we have today in ways that I have expressed this evening. This slide looks complicated, but if you come next time, I hope to unravel some of the complications for you, okay? So one of the people on this chart, he's on the far right side as you guys are looking at it, he's back highlight highlighted in blue is Syed Qutub. He is so highlighted because of his importance to this ideological transformational process. Like Abdullah Azam, who began this presentation, Syed Qutub was an educator. He was an Egyptian from a small village in the Southern Nile River Valley. He came to the big city of Cairo as World War I was only recently over, and the Egyptian people expressed their frustrations with their government and the controlling influence of imperial powers. Qutb's ideas about the connection of Islam and governance did not come all at once. Like many thinkers and terrorists of the pre-World War II period, he was a nationalist, and he proposed the development and improvement of Egypt for Egyptians. Qutb was a second or third-rate poet and literary critic. He developed and published several periodicals in which he regularly included his own works, which is probably the best way, I guess, if you're a third-rate poet, to get your stuff out. Though some of his poems and criticism garnered the attention of the elite in his field, he was not widely known nor easily recognized for his poetry or literary criticism. World War II was a testament of the problems of the West. The British exerted harsh martial law in Egypt over thought and printed expression despite espousing liberal ideals. The conflicts of Western ideologies had destroyed most of the developed world and was effectively enslaving the developing world. Qutb saw the Arabs as a people and believed that they should possess and control the lands in which they lived. This should not be done by outside imperialists, nor should it be granted to outside peoples, such as the Zionists. He did, however, respect the Zionist ability to use violence to achieve their desired ends. 
1948, he finished what would come to be his first big success as an author, Social Justice in Islam. It is in this book that he espoused one of his most important ideas, which I quote from an excellent book written by John Calvert, uh, titled Syed Qutub, uh, quote, that Islam provides answers to situations facing Muslims in all times, close quote, meaning that Muslims did not need to look to the West to find out how to care for the poor, the ignorant, and the needy. The solutions were present in their own religion. Qutb traveled to America just as his book was sent to the publisher. His two years in America confirmed his pre-existing opinions of the problems with Western culture, materialistic, commercial, and oversexed. He wrote a paper titled, The America I Have Seen, which I recommend. It's like 17 pages long, and it's worth uh, having a look at, where he criticized, among other things, American hypocrisy with Jim Crow racism, the overt sexuality of the popular Broadway song, Baby, It's Cold Outside, <laughs> the inherent violence and barbarity of American football, and the inappropriate sexuality of American so Americans socially and especially at church. This was observed while he sojourned in the well-known den of iniquity that is Greeley, Colorado. <laughs> so Kutub returned to Egypt where he began his exegetic multi-volume work that is in here as In the Shade of the Quran. And just to, to explain that title, what he meant, he wrote a good chunk of this while he was in prison. But uh, what he meant of that was that, if, if you think of this from a Bedouin perspective, and it's hot, the sun's blazing down on you, shade is a blessing. And the notion is that the Quran provided him soothing comfort in his times of distress. So that's why in the shade. Sometimes you'll see it translated as in the shadow of the Quran, which sort of sounds a little creepy and evil. And that's not what he's getting at, uh, even if you might find his ideas creepy and evil. But anyway. Um, but in this work, he illuminates the poetic imagery and the meanings of the Quran. In Qutb, one can see the frustration of an educated middle-class thinker from the unaddressed colonial people. His writings, which presented more and more militant expressions of the right path to God, are read and referenced by every person we label an Islamist terrorist. His brother, taught, along with Abdullah Azam, Osama bin Laden. His family assisted Ayman Zawahri, the current leader of Al-Qaeda. I respectfully, I respectfully refer to him as the Kevin Bacon of terrorists, because everyone we are fighting is less than six degrees separated from him. <laughs> he is that influential, and the actions of the British and the Americans immediately preceding, during, and following World War II shaped much of his thinking. So World War II shaped the globe, and it scarred the Middle East. The transformation of the global economy elevated countries and players to new levels of influence. A Jewish state existed where there had not been one for 2,000 years. States in the region demonstrated their impotence with respect to opposing the will of great powers, or even enacting their own will, if different from that of the great powers. This caused groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and other non-state actors to form. First, they sought to change their nations from within, and then they sought their objectives outside the state structure. Non-state actors became the actors of dynamic action in the region. The global economic emphasis on oil drew the great powers to the Middle East, such that it is now the area where great power struggles play out. This didn't happen in a few years, but the titanic influence of World War II provided the impetus for these key realities to come to be. So I want to invite you to come to the next and final installment in this series. Okay, hopefully I can help you develop the empathy for those who oppose us, such that you can understand what they want and why they want it. Uh, I also invite you to check out my website and see the articles, books, uh, and films that I recommend. I'm always posting new recommendations, so I invite you also to connect with me on LinkedIn or go to the website to see the latest. So thank you very much. So I guess time for questions. Go easy on me.
Yes, sir. I, you're like the first hand up every time, so thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Much to my wife's chagrin. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he asked. Well, actually, let's get to the question. So I'm sorry. Okay, so the, the question is referenced to Charlie Wilson's war, uh, and the, the question is, did Charlie Wilson know what he was doing? Was he able, uh, and, and did he actually move it positively? Would that capture it properly? Uh, and, and one, uh, so I just want to warn everybody, there's a lot of swearing, and unfortunately, some nudity in the film, so I don't recommend it on those grounds necessarily, but it is a fascinating film at addressing our relationship with Afghanistan. Uh, for those of you guys not familiar with the film, Charlie Wilson was a uh, member of the House of Representatives. He was a, uh, from Texas. Uh, he actually did a lot of the things that the movie shows, uh, like he hired uh, really, really attractive women to work his office. He had no men working in his office for a reason. Anyway, which is part of what got him into trouble, uh, that and drug use. But he was also the guy who got wrapped up in supporting what is known as Operation Cyclone, which is the operation to support the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And I think the film sort of portrays it close enough to how it was in the sense that this was not intentional. This sort of was something he stumbled into, and he ended up recognizing this as an opportunity to fight the Soviets at little cost to the US, and he really pushed that forward. And he was one of the big movers uh, in the House of Representatives early to push it forward. But I would say one of the things that's left out of the story is there are a lot of other movers that are also happening, whether it's uh, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who's a huge mover in that regard as well. Uh, so obviously it doesn't cover everything, but I think as movies go, it's, it's somewhat historically accurate to include the swearing and the drug use. So, okay. <laughs> Sir, in the back with the camera, who makes me uncomfortable. Okay, go ahead. I'm trying not to make you too No, I'm joking. I'm just... The postscript of coming back to the question of terrorism, we did not talk about state-sponsored terrorism or false flag terrorism. And in early 1974, uh, Menachem Begin, who I believe was part of the Erd movement, who did help blow up the St. David Hotel bombing, he was very insulted when a journalist uh, said, how do you feel being the father of terrorism in the Middle East, especially with everything that's going on? He's like, the father of terrorism in the Middle East, you mean of the world, right? And so this is the history of terrorism sophomore class, the Jedi Knights, published a paper that was quoted very interesting. What's your question? Especially in terms of what happened the next day, they said Mossad, ruthless, cunning, with the ability to target American troops and make it look like it's very Okay. And, it, and it, it, what would you say about the problem of Israeli state-sponsored terrorism, as also especially directed against the United States? Okay, so... Uh, they're ready. Well, okay, the question is, what would I say about Israeli state-sponsored terrorism? Uh, and, and one of the things, obviously, because I actually had you at, a, at another presentation I gave, uh, remember the United States uh, government does not define terrorism as something that can be done by a state. I appreciate in the region it's defined very, very differently. Uh, so from a United States government perspective, and I want to point out in the very first slide, it says I am not speaking as a representative of the United States government make that clear for the recording devices. But uh, as far as the United States government is concerned legally, there is no such thing. Regionally, obviously there is. Uh, and they look at that uh, very harshly. So one of the things uh, I say quite often, and to include in uh, this most recent book that's coming out, is uh, the way the West looks at terrorism is it's the weak, again, it's a tactic of the weak against the strong. The way the region, as in the Middle East, looks at terrorism is it's a tactic of the strong against the weak. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at that uh, because I think that answers the question in a way anyway. So, sir, and then we'll go over here. Yes, um, so you just 
spoke about the four uh, major categories of scars uh, left after World War II. But from your perspective, what, what do you think we have learned from uh, that that would give us a path forward? I mean, it's very interesting to look backward and lots of things have gone on in the Middle East. But what, based on what you know about the history, have you any insights? Okay, so the I guess in the we is the United States that, that you mean. Okay, so so what have we learned uh, from this experience uh, in the Middle East? I'm assuming since World War II and that period. Uh, okay, I, I don't want to just give the scoffing laugh that was given, uh, but there are times. Uh, so as was introduced, uh, my family and I. Uh, lived in the Middle East for eight-ish years. Uh, and there were days that I would come home from work uh, where I would think, ah, we're never, there'll never be peace in the Middle East. And there were occasionally days that I would come home from work, very few, but they were there where I was like, ah, maybe it's possible. Uh, and I think there, w what I found amazing is how many people do really know the history, the culture, the language. There are a lot of American uh, government officials. I worked with several ambassadors who were just really smart. A lot of guys in the State Department who really were. Uh, part of the challenge is with our system of how we operate is how do you get that regional observation by somebody who spent a lot of time there, kind of knows what's going on, actually back into the ears of the people that matter. Uh, and that's true, that problem exists in every single administration, irrespective of party. Uh, that there are people on the ground who tend to really do know what, what's happening. Uh, and the challenge is, how do you get that into the bubble of the Beltway in DC, so that the people who make the decisions listen to those voices. So I think we've learned a lot at, at, at the mid-level and lower, uh, and, and even at the upper levels. The challenge is always the, the DC Beltway is driven by what's important in DC, not necessarily what's important outside. And, and the challenge is how to couch that. Uh, and I don't think we've, and so that's learning how to work within our political system more than it's actually learning the region. Uh, and that's something we still have to work on. Both, I would say that's true of the State Department, it's also true for the military, is being able to con communicate accurate assessments back to the country. So, sir, you've been polite. I grew up and then... in Saudi Arabia. My father was head of exploration for Ramco. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I saw in the 60s was we went to Cairo or Beirut, which were the most civilized places in the Middle East. The women, Arab women, were dressed the same as they were in the States, in London or Paris. Huh. Now we've got them all back in the 12th century. Huh. What's happened? Okay, so the question is why has there been a regression uh, well, I don't even want to call it a change in women's dress from maybe the 50s and 60s where uh, everybody wanted to dress like Audrey Hepburn. Women's status too. Right. Uh, well, I don't know that that's true. But, uh, but uh, and I think it was true. Everybody wanted to dress like Audrey Hepburn. Like, who wouldn't, right? Uh, I mean, other than me. I mean, I wouldn't. But, uh, but um, and then why are they so covered? And, and we saw the same thing. We, we showed up in Jordan in 2005. Uh, and just in the three and a half years we lived there, we saw uh, more and more, uh, as a percentage of the, of the women, that we saw more and more of them uh, wore the hijab, for example. Uh, now, w one of the things I would offer as a caution is we interpret the wearing of the hijab as a negative. Like we, uh, I, I almost mistakenly said it, we see that as a regression. Uh, certainly the women I knew, and obviously as a Western man, I couldn't talk to a lot of women in the region, but the women I could talk to and did interact with, most of the women who wore the hijab, they did not look at it as an oppressive garment. They looked at it as a statement of their faith. And it was a positive step for them and not a negative. And one of the things that changes from, say, the mid-50s to the present is in the mid-50s, people in the, and, and even into the 60s, people in the Middle East wanted to be Western. They do not want to be Western today. They may love Western movies. They may love Ray-Bans. They may love Nikes or whatever else. 
but they want to be Middle Eastern. And I think that is a change that does happen, where they are quite comfortable expressing their own culture and their own faith, uh, and as opposed to wanting to be like Audrey Hepburn. They don't, now they don't want to dress like her, uh, even if they still might, well, I don't know if they, certainly the young kids don't watch her movies, but anyway, so I, I hope that answers that. Sir. Okay, so, I, so this is, I, I'm going to kind of focus on the CIA just, so this is the role of the, the CIA writ large or uh, how we went from sort of this pan-Arabist secularist effort to, to sort of changing that. Uh, and Kermit Roosevelt's fascinating. He's an interesting cat. We actually have a Kermit Roosevelt lecture series at the Command and General Staff College, which I find a little bit ironic, actually. Uh, but it's... He was an interesting player. So, like, he's hip deep in the Mohammed Mossadegh thing. So, you know, when Jason Bourne rolls in and we're tossing Mossadegh out of his own country, uh, actually, that's more like John McClain throws him out of his own party, I guess. But uh, when, when uh, we roll in, it's, this is Kermit Roosevelt, who's the main uh, orchestra leader to, to get all these things happening. Uh, and most of it is not uh, what's interesting with the Mossadegh play is this is not Roosevelt going in directing Jason Bourne or that kind of thing. This is him using money, using uh, to pay people to print things in opposition to Mossadegh, use, to pay uh, thugs on the street to go out and demonstrate that Mossadegh can't control the streets. So it's not us actually doing things in the sense of uh, sort of the sexy Hollywood stuff. It's us just using American, good old American dollars to uh, destabilize the existing regime. Um, and so he was hip deep in that. One of the things that, one of our challenges, so it's why the Cold War is, is one of these four distinctions, is that we have a hard time looking at the world in anything other than black and white in the 50s and 60s. And you're either sort of the classic, you're either with us or against us, you're either with us or the Soviets. And uh, so, so long as the Arab nationalists were perceived as being pro-American, we were happy to work with them and help them. But soon as they're perceived as being pro-Soviet, uh, and of course Nasser, like a lot of the smart, uh, whatever, third world, and this is kind of where the third world gets its name, by the way, is they wanted to offer a third way. We often refer to them as the non-aligned states and, and those terms, but, but they also themselves refer to themselves as the third world in that you have a first and second between the US and the USSR and their alliances, and then you have a third, this not, we're not with one or two, we're something different. And so the third world wasn't necessarily a pejorative of developing countries, it was a pejorative, well, it wasn't a pejorative at all, it was a we're not with you kind of thing. Um, and so soon as they were perceived as not playing our game, then we tried to play hardball with them. And, and that ended up, uh, and, and to a degree, Nasser paid a bit of a price. Uh, but he didn't really feel it, obviously, until the 67 war. And that's what ended up hurting him uh, more than anything he did with respect to the US. Because at that point, we had sort of poisoned our relationship on the Arab street. Uh, and we'd already hurt ourselves. OK. So sorry, we're, we're going to go to the back, and then we'll come up here. So sir. Uh, I think by the end of the war, the numbers, 
I want to say 50,000, but the number 30,000 is also in my head. So I, I, I can't remember now whether it's 30 or 50. But it's basically, we had about two, the equivalent of two divisions worth of soldiers there plus other. So I think it's 50 is ish the number. Yes, absolutely. As an occupying army? Uh, well, as an occup well, yes, as an occupying army. So there's like one, one of the sad stories coming out of this, and it's, what's sad is it gets repeated in other countries where we put lots and lots of soldiers, is uh, we had a habit as we were, I mean, part of this is this is a pretty fast-moving train, both literally and figuratively, going through Iran. Because we're trying to move, you know, as you saw, hundreds of thousands of trucks uh, on Iranian roads. And imagine American drivers, some of these kids hadn't really driven before they joined the Army, right? Because this is 1940s, and most of those guys didn't have cars on the farm. So now they're showing up, or in the cities, now they're showing up, they're driving a truck through a foreign country. Uh, and, they're, and if you've ever been to the Middle East, we realize this quite often, that people just walk on the roads. Uh, and they don't necessarily get off the roads when a car's coming. And if you're not paying attention, you're going to easily run into some sheep or somebody, right? And, uh, and the Americans did this more often than we care to remember in Iran, to the point that it was complained about uh, to the U.S. ambassador in Iran. And then uh, the military gave the answer that the Iranians, not being familiar with motor vehicles, don't know how to move off the roads. And so it's their fault for not getting out of the way. So that was sort of the first interaction that a lot of Iranians had with Americans. It wasn't just with an occupying power, but was with getting run over by a two and a half ton truck, which <laughs> is, is even worse, I would think, is, if that's your interaction. Yes, ma'am. So the recent attack in the Saudi oil, oil fields, how would that fit in with the analysis of given us? And is it related to SARS and World War II? Well, okay, not really. It's okay. So the question, I'm sorry. The question is, uh, how does the recent attack on the Saudi oil field relate to these scars uh, that I've talked about? And and I would argue that the scars that that is most connected with are the scars from 1979, uh, which we'll talk about next time. Uh, so because before that. Saudi Arabia and Iran were our two pillars in the region that we kind of expected. They were going to be our beat cops. We weren't going to deal with the Middle East, but Saudi Arabia and Iran were going to deal with the Middle East. And we were just going to develop their military and their security forces to deal with that. Uh, when the Shah falls and the Iranian revolution succeeds, uh, then what we end up having is rather than a, a somewhat of a collegial relationship between Riyadh and Tehran, it now becomes an adversarial relationship. So I would say that most of what we're looking at now is more a repercussion of 79 than it is a repercussion of 45. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so thank you for asking an easy question. Uh, so her question is, how do I see the differences between the Sunni religion and the Shia religion in having influence in the Middle East? Is that correct? Okay. Okay. So w one of the things, I, so, so uh, for those of you guys, well, you guys are all well informed or you wouldn't be here on a Wednesday night, right? Um, uh, so uh, the Sunni religion is the, or the, that's not right. The Sunni sect within Islam is the largest sect, okay? But that's almost like to say Sunni sect is like saying Protestantism or Orthodoxy or uh, Catholicism. It's, there are lots of subsets with, within that, but I will just, for simplicity's sake, Sunni is the vast majority of Muslims or Sunni, okay? Uh, but don't ever ask one, are you Sunni? Okay, because they will just say, I'm Muslim, and like, they, don't, they don't accept that division. That's what uh, redneck Westerners call them, I guess. Um, but, but what's interesting is, so it's like 85%, something like that, uh, of the global uh, Muslim population is Sunni. 
And so Americans tend to look at that. But if we understand uh, the number one most populous Muslim country is Indonesia. Number two, depending on which source you're looking at, is either Pakistan or India. Uh, so two and three are Pakistan and India, and some say it's Pakistan, some say it's India. So it's, it's, it's a, a ish about that. So most of the countries that have the largest populations uh, of Muslims are predominantly, almost entirely Sunni. Uh, and, but they're not in the Middle East, really. Uh, and so what's fascinating, because we lived in Jordan, and the Jordanians were particularly concerned about what they would refer to as a Shia crescent. And then it was one of the things that they had in common with the Israelis. And when we went across the border to Israel, they were also concerned with what they called a Shia crescent. And what was funny was to see the American reaction, because we tend to poo-poo it, because we'll look at it as, oh, well, 85% are Sunni. Why are you worried about this 15% of the population? But if you actually look at the population just in the Levant, so that, that area just in the, uh, on the eastern part of the Mediterranean, Iran is the largest, pop, most heavily populated country in the region, and it is 95% Shia. And when you put the population, the Shia population in Lebanon and Syria together, and as most people in the region don't, you don't count Turkey or you don't count Egypt, because sometimes Egypt is Egyptian and sometimes it's Arab. And it depends on the issue. So the region sometimes counts them and sometimes doesn't. It depends on what. So if you don't count Egypt and Turkey, then the Shia actually outnumber the Sunni in that area, to include the Arabian Peninsula. So for them, they see this as sort of this wave of Shiism that's, uh, that's kind of spreading over the region. And they look at that as a concern, which is in part what Riyadh is trying to do. Now, historically, Iraq was the bulwark that kept the Shia tidal wave at bay. And of course, we, we, we blew up that, that dam, and then the flood came over everybody, which is why we're not, you know, like when we said we were getting rid of Saddam Hussein, they weren't as happy as we thought they would be. And we thought that, oh, no, 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 seriously, we're really going to get rid of them this time. And we didn't understand or didn't appreciate that it's like, look, that's not what we're worried about. What are you replacing him with? And then we said, oh, well, we're going to replace him with the floodwaters. They're like, oh, well, we don't like that. And, and so most of the Gulf, Gulf Cooperation Council countries were not happy with Saddam leaving, even if they d disliked him because they saw him as a necessary uh, Bulwark, which is also why Saddam wanted to shake him down for money, because it's like, look, I'm doing all the fighting. I'm doing my job. You pay up. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot more to that story, but that's the brief part. The eastern province of Saudi Arabia has a substantial congregation of Shias. Right. Yeah. So, it, it, yeah. So uh, gentleman's point is the eastern province of Saudi Arabia has a, a lot of Shia, and, and of and which is interesting, not officially, but yes, they do. And, and Bahrain, as a country, is predominantly Shia, like 70% Shia. Uh, it's a majority Shia country. Now, it's a really small population, but so overall numbers are not huge, but it's a, dom it's a predominantly Shia country as well. Oh, I, I'm sure we probably did, no, but... Probably. But, but we had tons of air bases throughout. One of the things I talked about in the previous presentation is all the other activities we were doing in the region. So when we shipped that Persian corridor, we brought things in that were already made, and then we would just ship them through. We also made things in region, like so they'd bring in raw materials or parts. We would either do assembly or total manufacture. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we did throughout the Persian Gulf area, some of it in Iran itself, some of it in what is today Iraq, some of it in, well, it was then Iraq too, and some of it in Saudi Arabia as well. And there were a whole bunch of air bases, both British and, and American, well, and we flew out of British air bases throughout the region as well. B-36s and B-52s stationed there. Yeah, but that's after World War II. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir.
Hitler and Mussolini to use them as a pro-Nazi um, combat force in the Levant in, against the British. Um, I thought that was a lie, but apparently it, it was discussed in 1985 in New York Times, and it was not. And then Greg went back. But I, do you know about that? Well, first of all, no, I don't. So this is a question of uh, Yitzhak Shamir and some other gentlemen. Okay, okay, yeah, whether or not they appealed to, to work for the fascist government. And, however, my thought after your presentation on North Africa was that they may have thought that the, the Allies were going to win or were going to lose and the Nazis would control the Middle East. Well, in, in, in 41 or 42, it, it would not surprise me. There's a lot of things that wouldn't surprise me about the Middle East. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if guys were making overtures to, to figure out who was going to offer deals. But it, was, it would have been absolutely inconceivable, so I'll use the Princess Bride word, uh, to think that Hitler was never going to cut a deal with them. And, and they knew that. So maybe with Mussolini, that's possible. But I, I doubt, I cannot imagine. But once again, now, is it possible that they might have done this? I don't know. Well, as soon as so. Yeah. But Eichmann apparently had an appointment in Cairo to meet with them, and uh, that was that was the end of it when the U.S. declared war on Germany or vice versa. But that's okay. confirmed by New York Times in a spate of articles in 85, and I thought, this can't possibly be true, but it is seriously kind of obscene. I would agree with you on the obscene part, but I don't, I, I don't, I'm not aware of that, so I'm going to, I'm going to table that one. Okay. <laughs> So, sir, in the back. You, you uh, uh, asserted that without the oil from Britain, the Marshall Plan would not have been uh, worked. It seems like a pretty good claim to me. Uh, I, I said without the oil from Saudi Arabia, the Marshall Plan would not have worked. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, without, the, without Saudi Arabia keeping the price of oil at a crazy low level, like from the Arab perspective, I, I, remember, I can't remember the year now, but I want to say it was in the 50s uh, that they one time held up a, a Coke, and it's like, you know, we pay more for a Coke, the Arab was saying this, we pay more for a Coke than you pay for a barrel of oil. Gasoline was five cents a gallon. Yeah, and, and so, they're, they're the, so the idea that Europe got crazy cheap oil for a long, long time, uh, primarily thanks to the Saudis. Now, we, we did a good deal with Aramco with respect to, to profit sharings, regionally speaking, uh, because we were very quickly doing 50-50, uh, which is part of what Mossadegh was arguing with with BP. Well, not then BP, it was uh, the, uh, something different. But, yeah, but uh, that's part of what Mossadegh was arguing for was a 50-50 split, and, and it wasn't, the British weren't even given anything close to that. Well, because if you, if you didn't have the oil, then the economy, you, you wouldn't have generated the electricity they needed because all the electrical plants were shifting over, not all of them. Well, eventually, all of them shifted over to oil. So they, they needed that oil for, to fuel their economy. All of Europe was destroyed. Yeah. So Everything in yeah. France, Britain, and Germany was rubble. Okay. So, anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much. Have a good evening.